January 21st, 2020 meeting of the Buncombe County Commission. Um, we'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. And I believe we're ready to begin the introductory video. I'd like to call the January 21st, 2020 meeting of the Buncombe County Commission to order. Thank you all for being with us this evening. And let's begin our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. If everyone would rise and join us in the pledge. Monday, January 20th, our community along with others across North Carolina and the nation observed the day set aside to recognize the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This day has been set aside by the state of North Carolina and the Congress of the United States to recognize a man who changed our country. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. dedicated his life to tearing down the walls of segregation and to the advancement of equal rights for all. He helped America become a better place by confronting our nation's legacy of slavery and discrimination. He carried out his work not by appeals to anger 
or calls for revenge, but through a commitment to justice, through reconciliation, peace, and nonviolence, all of which were inspired by his deep Christian faith. Before we begin our meeting this evening, let's hold a moment of silence for prayer and reflection on the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and all the men and women in our country who have fought for and sacrificed to advance the cause of freedom, equality, and justice for all. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. And thank you again for joining us for our meeting this evening. I have a few announcements to make. Uh, if you have uh, used the county parking facility or bus passes to attend the meeting, this county commission meeting, uh, your parking can be validated uh, by one of the officers who's with us this evening to see them on their way out, and they're happy to validate your parking or transit pass. That is valid for today only. We read the ethics reminder to the board. In accordance with the code of ethics adopted by the board, all county commissioners have a duty to obey all applicable laws regarding official actions, to uphold the integrity and independence of the office, to avoid impropriety in the exercise of official duties, to faithfully perform the duties of the office, and to conduct the affairs of the governing board in an open public manner. Is there any item on the agenda, the outcome of which would have a direct, substantial, and readily identifiable financial impact for any board member? Does any board member have a financial interest in any public contract coming before the board today? There being none, all board members have a duty and obligation to vote on any matters voted on by the board at this meeting. All right. Uh, before we move to the consent agenda, I'd like to acknowledge we have uh, former Sheriff Van Duncan with us in our meeting this evening. Sheriff, it's, uh, it's always great to see you. Thank you for being with us this evening. All right. Um, consent agenda. Uh, I think we've got a couple of things um, to uh, add and maybe take off, and there might be some things we also want to take off the consent agenda. So let me get started, and if others have things to add, uh, please follow up. Uh, first, uh, there's been a request to remove the donation to benefit, uh, nonprofit donation uh, to benefit children in foster care, to remove that item from the consent agenda for this meeting. Um, there's also been a request to add the a resolution recognizing uh, February's National Radon Action Month in Buncombe County. January, thank you. Which is why we're doing it in January. <laughs> right. Um, is there any objection to adding the radon awareness resolution? Right. Okay. Um, Commissioner Fryer, did you have some other items you uh, indicated you'd like to take off the consent agenda? You might could hear me a little better. Uh, is the, the last one a resolution for the study? The transit the study? Broad River. Okay. Study. Must study. Okay. We'll take uh, we'll take that off the consent agenda. So if someone could be prepared, is there someone here who can speak to that? Um, Matt's no, Matt's here. Matt's okay, great. Matt, if you could be prepared to just answer a question and we'll vote on that. We'll vote on that item separately. Okay. All right. Um, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? item with the addition well actually let, let me um let me let me add the radon awareness resolution we'll do that after the um we'll do that right after good news okay so is there a motion to approve the consent agenda with the addition of the radon resolution after good news the removal of the nonprofit donation to benefit children in foster care and taking the transit feasibility study off the consent agenda, uh, we will um, we'll take that up after we approve the consent agenda, but as a separate item. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any
any opposed? All right. Um, Matt, could you uh, come forward and, uh, Commissioner Farr, do you have a particular question about the, uh, or are you looking for additional information about the uh, transit um, what feasibility you? study? Uh, yeah. What it is is, I asked a question the last time around. I talked worse, but I'm talking almost a little better. But uh, it's costing the county twenty thousand. It's costing the city seven thousand. Well, we got a lot of other municipalities: Count Billmore Forest, Monterey, you know, Black Mountain, Woodfin, and all them, with no input whatsoever. So. Uh, I'm totally against the investment in this period. So it's, you know, I know it's supposedly tied into something, but it seems like the county is the, the big bully that always gets to help the city. And that's where I'm at. Okay, thank you. There may not be a question, but, um, so could you just uh, let me just kind of reiterate what my understanding of the purpose of this is. So the idea is to do a study about um, a, to do a regional transit study. You know, the city runs a transit system. We run a transit system. Hendersonville runs a transit system. There's a lot of different separate systems operated in Western North Carolina. Uh, having uh, from the previous presentations we've had about this, my understanding is to basically kind of take a look at this and determine if we're currently operating all these separate systems in the most efficient and effective way that that they can be operated. So it's, um, you know, to me that seems, so it seems like a really good idea. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, so I think the, the purpose of this is very practical and there's no predetermined outcome for what might come of it. Maybe they come back and say, you know, it's being run in the most efficient way it can be. Or maybe they come back and say, you know, it doesn't make sense to have all these separate agencies all trying to do the same thing. Maybe we should integrate some of these different services to better serve the people in our community. I don't, I don't have any sense of what might come of it, but the idea of taking a look at this seems eminently practical to me, so I'm certainly supportive of it. In terms of the uh, funding allocation, you know, I mean, frankly, I mean, the, the one group of people who seem like they're sort of being, um, maybe arguably not being treated fair, are the taxpayers in Asheville because they already pay county taxes, right? So they're paying county taxes like everybody else, but they're also being asked to pay an additional $7,000. So I don't look at this as the county just helping out people in Asheville. If anything, I think they have a pretty good argument. They're having to pay twice for this, whereas people in Black Mountain and Weaverville and everywhere else only pay once. So, but I think it's, um, they're willing to do it. So if, if Asheville's willing to contribute, which I understand that they have agreed to that, then uh, I don't see any reason we, uh, we should um, not move ahead. That's my, my two cents on it. Any other comments or questions from other commissioners? I just have a question for Matt. As far as uh, the reliability of the study, what's your, what's your thoughts on that you know, in past you know, selection and in this current one? Um, so the MPO will actually do a request for qualifications. They'll actually go through the whole um, process of identifying a qualified vendor and then working with them to produce um, the study results. Um, they're going to go through a process just like we would in terms of, of vendor selection. Um, and then the results of the study, as, as has been mentioned, acknowledging that the study is going to be undertaken by the MPO isn't endorsing any of its findings or results, so there would certainly be a review at the completion of any study that was conducted to determine the merits of the study. So, and would you remind us who the uh, MPO is made up of? In its entirety. So the MPO includes all the urbanized areas um, in Buncombe, <coughs> Henderson, Madison, and Haywood. So there are representatives from those municipalities on that board? So, and it's a complicated structure um, that was agreed to long, long ago, but there are representatives from all of the counties and all the municipalities within each of those counties. On yeah. board. And I just want to make sure, and um, and. and Commissioner Fryer's point is very valid that we, we have to make sure that the, the, you know, the cost on this is, uh, is paid by the right people and that those people in those other municipalities are not getting railroaded by another one and that they're not uh, participating fairly. And I think that in this case, the way the MPO is set up, that, that addition, the money that's paid by Buckham County actually 
uh, represents all those other municipalities. So they're not being left out. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't disagree that it's frustrating sometimes. It seems like we're paying for, you know, studies for, for other people, but the MPO is set up a little bit differently. And uh, like I said, I share uh, Commissioner Fryer's concern. We should look at, look at, look at all that, the cost associated with it. And, and we will, but the MPO is a pretty complicated, you know, mechanism that, that takes care of all the roads and everything in two districts, right? Right. So they're responsible for um, various planning aspects um, as required by federal and state government uh, on behalf of the counties and municipalities in the region. Is this pretty much the only place we can go to or the most practical place to go to for this type of study? Um, as the regional kind of entity, it will be the logical place where that kind of study would be conducted, um, partly because you have member government representation on a board that through their process has identified that this would be an appropriate state to undertake and are aware of the different contributions that they're making in order for that study to proceed. Okay, thanks. There he goes. <clears throat> it says here a resolution for French Broad River Municipality Planning. French Broad River Municipality Planning. Basically what I see. And that's, that's basically would be running through the city more than it would the county. Uh, and the, it's the Metropolitan Planning Organization, so they're charged with representing all of the urbanized area, which is largely within your municipal jurisdiction, but it also extends beyond that into the rural areas as well. Um, it's a defined boundary established by the census. So there are portions of Buncombe County. Some counties, for example, Henderson County chooses to be fully represented by the MPO, so they've identified their entire county as being an urbanized area for purposes of, of how they participate in that regional government. So let me let me make a suggestion for the for the board and for uh, 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 county manager maybe to consider uh, the French Broad MPO is a very complicated board. Uh, it'd be good for all of us up here to know more about it. I think it'd be good for uh, for us to have a presentation, show the map, because you know Commissioner Fryer's you know logic is right, but when you see a map if, and you really see what the French Broad MPO is, it's it's I mean it covers. A vast area, and I think it'd be good for us to have that here. So that the, we have two commissioners on the, on the MPO, and we have others maybe that have served before. But all of us need to know as much as we can about that, so that when we have discussions like this, we we know as much as we can. So I I like to see us do that. I mean, to show the maps, who's represented, and here's what the MPO is, and here's what they do, because it's uh, a lot of a lot of decisions that beneficial to Buncombe County and have been beneficial to the that board. I understand twenty thousand dollars is not a lot, but twenty can turn into two million quickly. The way this you know, county works, and I've seen it happen more than one time. So we have a bus. Hendersonville has a bus. It's not their city bus. It's a different. It's kind of like our trailblazer. But that's, you know, they're happy with it. We are a county. I'm happy with our trailblazers. They do a great job for what we do. Brownie, there's other things in this county that the city uses more than the county does, like the jail, 66%. So, you know, 33% is not 66. So, you know, we have to look at all areas of what we're looking at, not just this area. But right now, if you look at the city of Iceville, their bus still has gone up double in the last five years. It went from 2.9 to 5.9. Now they're 500,000 in the hole. So why are we even talking about tying in with somebody that can't even run a budget right? So Commissioner, may I say that the 20,000 that we're discussing for the study is part of our membership dues to MPO. This is not additional county funding. As a member of the MPO, we are assessed the due, and we pay those dues annually, and that part of that dues is what's going to fund the study. It's not additional 20. And Matt, if I'm incorrect, please correct me. I just want to make sure that I brought that out. Thank you. And That's an important clarification. This is really just, uh, I think the MPO just wants to know that if you're going to do this, you know, kind of feasibility assessment of looking at possible different uh, ways to make the regional transit more efficient, they just want all the participants to be aware of it on the front end so that they don't do it and then after it's all done everyone says hey 
where did this come from? I think they just want everyone to be kind of looped in on this is a process. If you don't like any of the results, that's fine. You can keep doing it the way you're doing it now. But um, it's just informational. All right. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Uh, there was not a request to uh, have public comment on this, and we're following our policy. So, if people had requested it, three people requested it, we would have done it. Yeah. Oh, you know what? You know what? Like, I'll acknowledge an error when I make one. We did not request comment on the consent agenda. This originally was. So, yeah, I, I will. And I'm sorry we've already voted. So, that's that's an error on my part. You're welcome. You're welcome to do so. Thank you very much. Yeah. Brownie, I appreciate that very much. I'll, I'll tell you when you're right and I'll tell you when you're wrong, and you know that. I'd like to heard the question, how much is the study going to toss totally, and what is each municipality and county participating in, and what is their percent of the cost? In other words, when I hear the word complex formula and complex board, you know what I think? BS. All you got to do is ask the simple questions. And nobody on the board asked that question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any, any other members of the public have any questions about any items that are on the consent agenda? All right. Uh, um, if I may, Chairman, mm -hmm. uh, I did make a suggestion, did not hear from the board or the county manager on for the future, be able to put some explanation about the French Party MPO, M MPO, what it covers, what our dues covered, what some of the questions that's come up today, I think it'd be good for us to do that. Put it out to the public. See it? Can't it can't hurt. So yes, sir. I'd like to see if it's okay for direction from the board to do that. Without objection. That's fine. Okay, cool. Right. Thanks. All right. Um, all right, we now come to uh, good news. And I'm going to call on Commissioner Belcher to uh, uh, lead us on this item. So, can anybody hear me? Okay. I'm going to turn this way. I'm going to ask our. Uh, and Sheriff uh, Duncan, if you'd come up and uh, bring with uh, with you uh, Mr. Smart and and um, and I you bring whatever members of your family you want to. If you got ones you like, bring them all. <laughs> so, uh, Chairman, if it would be in order, maybe at the end we could have the commissioners come down and get a picture of us with uh, with. Uh, with Mr. Smart, somebody, hey, that's important. Somebody, you know, somebody's calling, oh, you don't answer that no more. You have to turn yourself on. <laughs> uh, I apologize, Yeah, my first meeting was a great ringtone, but it wasn't really for me. But anyhow, um, this is an opportunity that uh, that doesn't happen, that happen, re had to happen often. Recently, we had someone receive the order of the Longleaf Pine. And um, it is given by the governor upon recommendation and with 30 years continued service to the state of North Carolina. And it's, uh, it's an honor for us as a commission to be able to um, have someone present that to someone that has protected our county and our, and, uh, and our families for a long time. And um, I'm thankful that uh, the Smart family is here and, and, and you're here to, to present it as most appropriate. So I'm gonna turn it over to the Good evening, Commissioners. Good to be here with y'all again. Uh, Randy Smart, we're here tonight to honor his 30 years of service, military, and all those things that combined, but basically focusing on his 24 years at the Buncombe County Sheriff's Office to protect the citizens of this county. Uh, I, I'm honored that I got to work with Randy for most of that time. He actually went to work on my squad. I remember that very well when he started with the sheriff's office. But during his last 12 years is when he really got tasked with a lot of duties. And really when our sheriff's office saw a lot of significant uh, accomplishments. We saw a 30% reduction in crime from 06 to 18. 
We received a $800,000 grant for our SRO program, and we received an award from y'all's organization, your national organization, one of the only ones in North Carolina to receive that that year for our innovations in community policing. And if it sounds like I'm bragging, I am on all those folks that work to make that happen. Nobody was more pivotal to those things happening than Randy Smart. Now, during the, there, there was a huge team, and a lot of people pitched in, and a lot of people get to claim uh, uh, that I helped with that. But I really moved Randy around a lot in the sheriff's office during that point in time because of his ability to manage, his logistical skill, and putting the wheels on things. I talked with Chief, retired Chief Kevin Prescott today, and he goes, you know, Randy was always the behind-the-scenes guy that made sure the wheels were on the car when we were driving towards a new goal at the sheriff's office. He, he made sure that the money was there and the resources were used to accomplish those things. One thing that never changed, no matter where I moved him in the organization, was his undying commitment to that sheriff's office, the men and women that worked there to the citizens of Buncombe County. And that's why I'm really honored to be here today to present the Order of the Long Leaf Fund. And I'll have to stand in for the governor with this one. And I wish I would have brought my glasses. I think maybe I can read that. I should have it memorized, but I don't. Here's to the land of the Long Leaf Pine, the summer land where the sun does shine where the weak grow strong and the strong grow great, here's to the down home, the old North State. Randy, you're very deserving of this award, and I'm just honored to be here with you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, commissioners, for allowing me to come and be part of the meeting tonight to receive this. It is an honor to receive this award. Certainly, it, my biggest honor is to, to serve the people of Buckham County. Uh, it was uh, truly one of the best jobs I've ever had, and uh, I truly do miss it today. But I thank my family for supporting me throughout my career. But thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right, next up, uh, let's, I'd like to read the uh, resolution proclaiming uh, Buncombe County Proclamation in support of National Radon Action Month in Buncombe County, North Carolina. Whereas radon is a colorless, odorless, radioactive gas that may threaten the health of our citizens and their families, whereas radon is the second leading cause of lung cancer in the United States, and is the leading cause of lung cancer in non-smokers. Whereas radon is found in one in 15 homes across the United States, 
which have elevated radon levels. Whereas testing for radon is simple and inexpensive, and radon problems can be fixed. Whereas Buncombe County government, the U.S. Surgeon General, the United States Environmental Protection Agency, the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, North Carolina Radon Program, and the North Carolina Advisory Committee on Cancer Coordination and Control support efforts to encourage homeowners to test their homes for radon, have elevated, have elevated levels of radon reduced. Whereas many residents in Buncombe County don't know about radon, yet need to know for the safety and health of their families, and a proclamation of National Radon Action Month is an opportunity to educate individuals on the available measures to reduce radon. Now, therefore, the Buncombe County Board of Commissioners do hereby proclaim January 2020th as National Radon Action Month here in Buncombe County. And this is adopted the 21st day of January 2020. Is there a motion to approve this um, proclamation? All in favor, please say aye. 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 It's approved. All right. Do you not have any public hearings? So next on our agenda is the county manager's report. I turn it over to Ms. Pender for any updates. Thank you, sir. Tonight I want to introduce our new sir, emergency services director, Van Taylor Jones. Would you stand, ma'am? Van Taylor joins us from Anderson County, South Carolina, where he worked as emergency services director for almost 12 years. His more than 30 years of professional and volunteer experience covers a broad range of topics from disaster preparedness to fire services. Jones' cumulative knowledge also includes managing an annual budget of $10 million, making his combination of administrative acumen and practical skills a true asset for Buncombe County Emergency Services Director. Tonight, I'm pleased to recognize Van as our newest member. He started today as the Emergency Services Director for Buncombe County. So thanks for joining our team, Van. Thank y'all. Thank Ben, welcome. We're so so excited to have you here in Buckingham County. We know you're going to do a great job. So thank you so much. We look forward to working with you. Look forward to working with y'all. Thank y'all. You're welcome. I want to see what size shoes you got. <laughs> tough. You got some, well, not your shoes. You got tough shoes to fill, but welcome. Love, love your qualification. So let me tell you one quick story. Uh, please come up to the mic, Ben. Yeah, man. So I got to tell you one quick story about Jerry. So 15 years ago, when I became a certified emergency manager, he was the guy that reviewed my packet, and um, he went through it with all this detail. And he, I thought it was the best packet I'd ever put together as far as detail, everything in it. He sent it back. And he said, "You like these three things?" He said, "You got 24 hours to get it to me." I said, uh, "Hurricane Charlie, uh, the disaster response team." So I got it back to him, and you know, he come back to him and he said, oh, I was just kidding with you on that. But um, you know, that's kind of the way Jerry was. But, you know, he, I do have some big, uh, he left me with some big shoes to fill. And I'm tell you, I, uh, I'm going to take that in consideration every day and work hard, just like he did for 47 years, to make this community a disaster resilient community. And I appreciate this opportunity. Yeah, well, all right. Welcome. All right. Anything else? All right. Thank you. All right. Okay. We come to new business. The first item under new business is consideration of a budget amendment related to the Woodfin Greenway project. And Jennifer Barnett will address this item as well as the next new business item. Good evening, Chairman and Commissioners. Yes, the, the first item um, is related to the Woodfin Greenway project. You previously heard from Josh O'Connor, Recreation Services Director, um, on the December 17th pre-meeting. He provided you an overview of Greenway Projects and more specifically the Woodfin, Woodfin Greenway Project. Noted in the request for board action is information that outlines previously estimated amounts for design and construction for the Woodfin Greenway Project. The original planned amount for design is a total of $660,000. This was to be comprised of 528,000 grant award from the Federal Highway Administration, along with a county design match of 132,000. 
The county budget currently has $132,000 as the planned county match for design, as well as an additional $500,000 budgeted towards the construction phase. The budget amendment being brought forward this evening is a request to budget the $528,000 grant award for expenditures and associated revenues for design phase. The second request is to approve the reallocation of the county budgeted amounts towards design totaling $632,000. That would bring the available budget for design to $1,160,000, including the grant award and the existing county funding. We would anticipate a fiscal year 21 request to be brought forward for the remaining $457,800 to complete design. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Are there any additional questions? I just have one. So we're, what we're doing is we're, uh, we're moving the, the $500,000 from construction to design. That's correct. So we, so we have the total of $632,000, and the original plan was $132,000 towards design, and $500,000 being set aside in the last couple fiscal years towards construction. Right. So yes. So the, the new, new additional funds set aside tonight is what? So there are no additional county funds being requested this evening. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so, so we're just shifting from the design, um, from the construction to the design phase for those previously appropriated funds. Um, so no additional funds are needed now, though they may be down the road. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, because we are using funds for design that um, were earmarked originally for construction, but we don't have to fight that fight tonight. And there might be other sources of funds as we this project is um, as I recall this total project is um, in the neighborhood of ten million dollars and the county's funds are just a small fraction of that so there could be it's not it's not um, you know it's not this evening necessarily clear how the additional funds might be raised in the future we might there might be requests to us or it might be filled through other means that's just not something that we can know at this time but the decision tonight doesn't require any additional funding Right. So, and we know we know that there's there's a lot of money that's uh, funded from the, the TDA and some other other sources to make this reality. Federal funds and uh, what's the Woodfin uh, bond referendum? Right. Is a lot of it. So, but tonight is just moving five hundred and no new money tonight. No new money in terms of county. Our request is to be able to increase the budget for the Federal Highway Administration Award, right. $528,000. So that is the increase ask, which is not county dollars. It is the Federal Award dollars. Right. Okay, thanks. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. Okay. All right, there's a motion and second. Further discussion? So, so let me just, uh, just uh, remind the board the procedure we're going to use from the um, public comment. So if it's a public hearing, uh, we'll automatically have public comment. At the end of each meeting, we'll always have public comment. Um, but uh, and if we're going to take public comment under uh, new business, two commissioners need to request it. Under old business, three commissioners need to request it. So that's our adopted policy, and we'll, we'll follow that. So at this point, no one has requested public comment on this item, so we won't take it unless it's requested. I mean, I see some folks here. I'm just wondering if people are wanting to talk, and if they are, then I'm going to invite wanna, that. Then I want to invite it. Okay. Does anyone else wish to? All right. All right. Thank you. Are there members of the public wish to comment on the motion? Mr. Yellen. We can tell it's election year. Surprise, surprise, surprise. I appreciate the taking of public comment very much because you explained to me that we're taking planning money or construction money and putting in the planning. So basically we're delaying what we're going to put on construction or have to come up with extra money down the road. And folks, with what's going on with construction right now, you might as well forget that 10 million because if we keep building the bunkum like we're building, that 10 million is going to be 20 million. 
because I saw that property on Jupiter Road increased two tenths of a percent in 30 days. Two tenths of a percent. Now I've got your uh, county attorney over there and me. Two tenths of a percent in 30 days. So, yeah, I thank you for having the opportunity to make public comment. And like I said, I will compliment you when you do what you should so that we're open and transparent. Thank you very much. All right, uh, there's a motion and second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Next up, <coughs> uh, budget amendment for start program expansion. And for this budget amendment item, um, I do believe that Stoney Blevins and Rebecca Smith with Health and Human Services is going to um, do a short presentation and then follow that up with a request around the budget amendment. All right. Good evening, commissioners and members of the public, both in the room and watching at home. I just want to say that I really am both excited and encouraged about where we are in our fight against opioids and other substance use disorders in Buncombe County. I don't have to educate you on how many years now our community has really been ravaged uh, by this problem. We've lost too many citizens. Um, we've suffered in so many ways. and. When I look at a problem this big, you know, while you could argue about the semantics, it really often comes down to identifying the problem and then educating, uh, planning, mobilizing, and then finally moving to action. And I'm excited because we're really in a place, I feel like in Buncombe, where we are really able to mobilize and take real definitive action. And we've done a lot of fantastic things just this fiscal year. Uh, to date, uh, just HHS alone has received about $1.15 million uh, to attack this issue. But tonight I'm really excited about, I'm excited about all the new initiatives we're able to do, but tonight we're bringing before you an initiative that has already succeeded. Since 2017, we've been implementing the START initiative, and Dan Pizzo is with us. I have to recognize him, uh, some of our staff. Uh, this model has had tremendous success, and so what excites me tonight is two things. One, we have the opportunity to double that success, actually double the amount of service that we're providing at no cost to the county. And also, the other thing that excites me is this particular program really addresses somewhat the forgotten victims of substance use disorder sometimes, and that is children and, um, and families with children. And so. We're really excited to present this to you, and I just want to introduce Rebecca Smith, our social work director, who will walk you uh, through the details of the grant proposal. I think we have a PowerPoint presentation. Thank you. Um, commissioners, thank you for having me and allowing me to speak a little bit about the START um, model here in Buckham County. Um, like Stoney said, we're really appreciative of this opportunity um, both to have the original START team and to talk about expansion to um, a full new START team. Um, so uh, I know we have presented about the START model in the past to you all, but I wanted to just do a quick overview of what the START model entails. And that is that it's a trauma-informed, promising practice serving families with co-occurring child maltreatment and substance use disorder who have children um, ages six and under. Um, it's also a peer support model, and it's um, intervention for both moms and dads, which is really beneficial to our Child Protective Services um, system. It's an integrated program that engages and partners with the behavioral health and court systems, but is initiated and driven by Child Protective Services. It's focused on early crisis intervention, and that really is the key to um, helping families succeed, is to for our teams to get in early um, acknowledge the problem and help partner with families to um, come up with solutions. So um, the overview of the grant, we applied for this grant back in January of last year hoping that we would receive um, these funds in April of last year based on some information that we had from the state and from the Governor's Crime Commission. Unfortunately it took a little longer for this grant to actually come through than we anticipated. Um, and so it is a two-year grant. Um, the, the PowerPoint says that the grant cycle began April of 2019, 
we actually spoke with um, the Governor's Crime Commission and they're able to move that back to October of 2019. I didn't find that out until uh, late last week, so I apologize for, the, for that um, not being updated. Um, but we are going to be able to start that grant cycle in October and then go all the way through September 30th of 2021. Um, so that was good news. It's um, awarded by the Department of Public Safety and the Governor's Crime Commission. Um, it would be housed within um, Health and Human Services within the Social Work Department, and the total award is $1,385,760. Our goal with the grant would be to double the capacity to serve families. We would um, be able to add a, a full additional start team um, and serve twice as many families within this model. Also, we'd be able to continue to build a trauma-responsive culture within Buncombe County Child Protective Services. Um, as you all heard earlier, the START model truly is um, a trauma-informed model, and the peer support specialists specifically, the family mentors that work with us on the START team, really bring um, their experience and help us to un better understand how parents who um, are dealing with substance use disorder feel and um, what they respond to and how to inter interact and engage with them in a way um, that we're able to really make progress. Um, and then continue to reduce the number of children entering foster care. Um, I'll talk about more about that in a second. Um, and then when children do enter foster care, increase timely reunification rates. Um, this grant will also allow us, right now we are not um, keeping cases as part of the START team when a child enters foster care because we were worried about those um, cases filling up our START caseloads and not having the ability to serve families pre-custody. And this money will allow us to double the team and be able to take cases where children do have to come into custody, but our goal will be to get those children back in their homes as soon as possible. Um, so it really does open up um, great possibilities. As I said, um, <coughs> our goal will be to continue to reduce the number of children in foster care in Buncombe County. The chart that you can see there um, outlines where we were in June of 2017 having 392 children in foster care, and where we are, um, where we were in June, June 30th of 2019, which was at 331. Today, we are at 318 children in foster care, and that includes our 18 to 21 population. So you can see that ongoing trend down. Um, and we can't um, say that this is all because of the START model, but what we do know is that having START on board, having the peer mentors, um, join our teams has really changed our culture and the way that we um, address substance use disorder in Buncombe County. Um, and, sorry. So some of the grant activities, as I already mentioned, uh, would be to create and implement a second start team in Buncombe County by hiring and training staff and amending our contract with Family Preservation Services to add the additional contracted workers. We would expand start eligible cases to include cases moving directly from investigations to foster care, create case assignment process to account for the two teams, um, continue to evaluate and contribute to evidence the evidence base of the start model um, to increase opportunities for future 4E funding. This part is important because um, the Families First Prevention Law that was passed at the federal level um, in October of 2021, we're going to be able to use 4E dollars per, for prevention services. And we're very hopeful that the START model will be a part of that, those prevention services that will be able to be paid for with federal monies. And so the more we can contribute to the evidence base, the more likely we are to have that happen. Um, and then the grant will also allow us to work toward becoming a START certified site. And we would be the first site outside of the state of Kentucky to become certified. So there's the breakdown of the budget for the two-year grant. Um, we would be hiring um, four staff members as grant-funded employees um, with Health and Human Services, and then the other staff members would be hired through the contract with Family Preservation Services. And it would be set up similar to um, how we are doing, um, how we are, how we have set up for our first um, Team. I'm sorry, how many years is that? It's a two year okay. grant. So here's the personnel breakdown. Um, so the 
we would hire um, the three family mentors and the service coordinator and then the 10% of clinical supervisor. Those uh, folks are all hired through um, our contract with Family Preservation Services. And then we would hire the three CPS social workers and the social work supervisor as internal um, health and human services grant funded employees. Um, as you can see there, it mentions that all of this is covered by the grant. Um, there was a match requirement for this grant, but we were able to use existing, um, the existing dollars that we spend on our first start team to make that match. So there's no additional investment that is needed. Um, here are just some of the numbers about outcomes from our start model. Um, so since, uh, since 2017, we've served 65 families and you'll see some of the success rates there. Um, one of the most impressive things to me is how quickly we are able to help families engage in services. So within two days, 1.7 days of a family identifying that, yes, I want to be a part of the START program, we're able to do a comprehensive clinical assessment and help, um, help that family to access treatment services. Um, so there's not a delay, and we're able to um, build on the momentum that um, that the family has, has demonstrated. And then um, this slide just kind of talks about um, the gains versus the cost of the SART model. And this um, data is taken from Child and Family Futures, which um, is the, the contract agency that oversees the SART model. And um, we consult with them, and they're able to share their data with us. And so we're able to see um, from looking at the START model across the nation, um, these are the gains that, that have been seen from START. Three times lower rates of reoccurrence of maltreatment. For every dollar spent, $2.22 saved in the foster care system. Children being half as likely to enter foster care. And women doubling their rate of sobriety. So those are some of the outcomes nationwide um, for the, the minimal cost of the START program. Our sustainability plan for this grant would be um, really looking at the cost savings um, from preventing children from entering foster care. In addition, um, looking at 4E reimbursement under the Families First Prevention Law that uh, will come to the state of North Carolina in October of 2021. And then really um, having fewer children in foster care requires fewer social workers, and so being able to um, reinvest those dollars as we have those numbers come down um, into existing positions. Um, so what we're asking um, this evening is to approve the receipt of the um, grant monies, um, approve the establishment of the four full-time employees, um, which would be grant funded. Um, and again, that date is, is October of 2021, I'm sorry, uh, September 30th of 2021. And then um, the, like I said, the additional um, employees will be secured via the contract. So that's the, the presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. I have a question. I mean, I'm supportive of the, of the program. It's a great program. Um, the, the uh, how is the dollars determined on what goes into uh, the amount of um, team members that you have to hire and, and how they're paid and so on. How, how does that work? So the, um, so the way that we established the budget for the grant, um, we used existing um, salaries uh, for existing employees. So um, IATSW social worker salaries and then supervisor salaries um, for those grant funded positions. And then the contract, uh, we work with Family Preservation Services, and we basically contract for the START model, and so we'll be um, using those grant dollars to, to contract for twice as many um, employees from Family Preservation Services. Right. Okay, thanks. Just a brief comment to um, thank you and the rest of the team behind this work. I remember hearing updates about it in recent years, and it's really tremendous to see the kind of impact it's having in people's lives. Um, so thank you all for being out front on this, and it's exciting to see that it can be um, expanded uh, to reach that many more people. Thank you. How do you track long-term success? 
with the program and whether the whether it's working over the long haul good question so we are part of a larger evaluation like I said through child and family futures which is the purveyors of the start model and um, we contribute our evaluation data to them um, we're not in Buncombe County doing any um, long-term longitudinal study um, but um, they are and so um, there's actually uh, a whole research team that is um, dedicated to studying the SART model and looking at um, outcomes. And I'm happy to share any of those resources. There's multiple research papers that um, go into all the details about the, the success of the model. Um, there's not a ton of information yet about long-term impact because um, it is, it, uh, we're still early on. Would someone like to make a motion? Second. Further the discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 We opposed. All right, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate the updates and uh, look forward to hearing, for, hearing more as this goes forward. All right. Um, Commissioners, I also made one other oversight at the beginning of the meeting, which is that we did not, after spending three hours talking to all of these great applicants for our Greenways Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, we also needed to, we need to add that to the agenda too, because I think we are prepared to go ahead and uh, appoint folks. So it needs to be by consensus, but it's without objection, can we add that to the agenda to uh, go ahead and appoint people to the um, we, we, we will go over that because there is going to, I think there's going to, we, we're, we're seeking nine, we're seeking nine, uh, nine appointments. I believe based on the, the, prior to the start of our regular meeting, the county commission held a, about a three hour uh, special meeting to interview the applicants for our Greenways Parks Advisory Board. I believe based on that meeting, the board is interested in appointing eight of those positions tonight, but not, uh, I think we want to do additional interviews for the ninth position district. Yeah, for District 2. That's what I thought. We have. Yes. We're not. Yeah. So we will, we will not completely, we will not make 100% of the appointments tonight. Right. But I think we're prepared to make most of them. But it's still from the original list. It's not. Right. Could I have a motion? Can we just go ahead and have a motion to add this to the board appointments? We have more appointments on our agenda, but just to address the green ones. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Any opposed? All right, let's go ahead and take that one up first. I've got some notes, so let me let me see if I can go over what I believe we um, there was agreement to work on tonight. So just as a little bit of background, Parks, Recreation, and Greenways Advisory Board is a new advisory board for Buncombe County. Um, we voted to create this committee uh, several months ago. It includes nine members, three of which will be representing each of the three county commission districts in Buncombe County. And just because things, you know, everything needs to be complicated. Of course, these districts are going to change, but the, what the commission agreed to is that we're appointing people from the districts as they exist today. The districts will change after the 2020 elections, but for the purposes of these initial appointments, they are as the districts exist today. All right. So and we had we had uh, really um, and more than 20 people apply for this. It was very strong interest in it, so it was very difficult to narrow it down. And we appreciate everyone's interest in uh, from all the applicants um, from District One. Um, let me review review these names, and then perhaps someone would like to make a motion to appoint these uh, from District One. Uh, Sam Mason, Derek. Turno and Dusty Allison. So I'll make a motion to approve those to add to the. Is there a second? For this? A second. All right. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, for District 2, uh, again, there's three, three positions for each of the districts. For District 2, I believe uh, there was sort of consensus that we appoint, go ahead and appoint two of the applicants that we were able to interview 
today, but there were some applicants who were not uh, able to attend the interviews today, so we're not going to appoint all three. We're only going to appoint two, and uh, additional. Um, we'll do additional interviews before finalizing our decisions on District 2. But I believe there was support for Carol Peterson and Ann Babcock. So moved. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And then from District 3, Teresa Williams, Allie Howell, and Lena Richards. So moved. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, thank you very much. And again, I think we anticipate we will conduct additional interviews for the remaining position on District 2 um, before our next regularly scheduled county commission meeting in two weeks from today. Chairman, Chairman, I have, have a question. Uh, is, uh, uh, Lamar, clerk, this reach, reaches out to him to let them know that they have. Lamar, will you be reaching out to him to let them know? We will. Okay. That they've been appointed, yeah. We will do that. Um, also, um, are we not going to do this next week, the 28th, that interview the other person like we decide, or are we going to wait until the next meeting? Oh, that's right. That's right. So you talked about meeting next Tuesday rather than two weeks from today. Yeah, that's that, that's that what we discussed. Is there a problem with that? Mm. It's not. I just want to make sure. I'm sorry. No, okay. No, 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 no. <laughs> just, uh, maybe a little bit. You don't have. You don't have to. You don't have to go to this meeting. Okay. You can if you want that. Uh, okay. So 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 let's talk about that. So so we're going to have a special meeting. A week from today, on Tuesday, week from today, where we'll do additional, at least one additional interview for District 2, Parks and Rec, uh, Greenway. And then we're also going to do interviews for our uh, Strategic Partnership Advisory Committee, right, which we'll actually, and we can, let's go ahead and talk about that for a second too. So we have uh, another, another new Citizen Advisory Committee we have. Um, is the Citizen Advisory Board for Allocation of, or Recommendations on Strategic Partnership Grants Committee. This is also a new citizen committee with the county that will make recommendations in our budget process for investment of our funding in strategic partnerships. We've had 21 applicants for this committee, and um, I believe the board's view is we just, we're just gonna interview all the applicants for this board, and we'll do that next Tuesday, starting at one o'clock. And that will be a specially called meeting, but it's a it's a public meeting. So anyone who's interested is welcome to um, to attend. All right, and we appreciate everyone's interest in that as well. All right, we have several other boards and commissions this evening as well. Some of which we might be willing to uh, are ready to do something on. Others we might need to uh, take some more time on in light of the uh, extensive time Greenways and strategic partnerships is taking right now. Um, okay, so I'm just, I'm looking at the list here. There's no, um, these are mostly new appointments, not reappointments. So, I'm assuming that we're also going to want to do interviews with a lot for maybe all of these positions. But again, we might, you know, we're going to maybe need some more time on this in light of uh, the strategic partnership interviews we need to do. I do see that on EDC we have a, a reappointment. The downtown commission. I mean, I'm sorry. No, I was looking at economic development on the back side of the page. Uh, Commissioner Whitesides is representing the commission on EDC. Uh, currently, so uh, that's a reappointment. I'd be happy to go ahead and support that reappointment tonight for that position. Yeah. Um, All right, there's a motion. Second. All in favor of reappointing Al Whitesides to the Economic Development Commission? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, and also, um, Mr. Preston is currently serving with the MSD, right? This is not a new one. Right. Yeah. yeah. I'll make a motion to reappoint Commissioner Presley to the MSD. Second. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. We've got a couple of them done. Chairman, I'm going to make a recommendation. Looks like it's recommended by the EDC, and there's only one left to the appointments. I'm 
make a motion for William Hathaway for that second appointment. So I have a question on that. This was actually the position that started this whole conversation at the board. Um, so has no one else applied for this? No one else has applied. And we've advertised for this. We have position. advertised for this. Okay. Um, where do, how do tell, talk about how we advertise these? So is it just on the county website? Um, we partner with the communications department as well, and they put some information out on some of the social media sites as far as advertising as well. And I mean, it's, just, it's just sort of surprising that we get 20 for one group and none for another, especially one that's, you know, that would be of recent interest in. Oh, uh, well, I'm spending money, Chairman. Well, they're both spending money. Well, it's, it's a little different. I mean, it's the, I mean, a lot of people like to be involved and being able to suggest where you know money goes in the in the county. So, but it does shock me that DBC only has one. Okay, Ronnie. Yes, sir. I think uh, William Hathaway was recommended by the DBC board. Well, that's true. That we do have recommendations on most of these most of these boards. I guess. I guess you know. It seems like we're still, in some ways, um, maybe working through which of these boards we want to do interviews for and which ones we might want to utilize recommendations from the committees as uh, a basis for reappointment. I think we're doing it a bit of both currently, which is, um, you know. I will, also, I will also state that the Greenway Board and the Parks and Recreation and the Strategic Partnership is the first iteration of these boards. So there's not a board established, so the actual uh, commissioners are appointing these first iteration of these boards. So that is something to take in consideration. And I think on other boards, what we've, we've tried to do is if there, if there is more than one, we would typically, if there, if there was competition for one seat, we would interview. Right? Sometimes. <clears throat> All right, there's a motion. Is there a second? Or was there a second? Well, will you have one? A second. A second. All right, there's a motion and a second on the table. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Um, none, of the remaining, uh, none of the remaining positions are reappointments. They're all new appointments. Is that correct, Mr. Chairman? That is correct. Okay, um, Commission. I would I recommend we just take a take a pause on the others. We've got a lot of work to do on strategic partnerships and wrapping up the year. So why don't we why don't we work through that and then we'll uh, revisit kind of um, what we have the bandwidth for next at our at our next kind of commission meeting. Is that acceptable? Uh, on the downtown and the land conservation boards. Just wait on those. Is what, what you're saying? The ones that are multiple will probably manage. That's my thought process, yes. What about the HHS? There's only one. Um, That's a recommendation. I'm open to uh, taking care of that right now if you want to. I'll, I'll make a motion to approve. Second. All right, there's a motion and second to appoint Dr. John Bailey. Yeah. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Yeah. All right. We're a little burned. A little road weary on the forward All right. Thank you, commissioners. All right, we now come to public comment, uh, and we should speak to the board. Have three minutes to do so. Um, we invite you to come up and just let us know your name and where you live, and uh, you'll get an orange light when you have 30 seconds left, and a red light when your time's up. And we ask that folks uh, wrap up their comments when time's up because we want to give everyone the same amount of time. Uh, yes, ma'am, you would like to uh, start, or uh, you can go second, or. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm Emory Underwood, and I live in Montreat. Been there second longest of any place I've lived. And this has to do with a recent election, or non-election, actually, in Montreat, Black Mountain, and Biltmore Forest. The commissioners there decided that they wanted to serve another year without an election, and this was actually approved by the state. Now, I know nobody here, you can't actually do anything, but what I'm hoping is there can be some voice on this, because it, it you know, I thought possibly of running myself, but I decided not to, 
And of course, they decided, you know, you can save even more money by putting off election a couple of more years. And to save a little more money, you don't have an election at all. You appoint your successors. So I think the idea of trying to save money was not, and I don't think it saved much money, if any. So that's my thought on it. And we'd like to have a voice from here, even though I know you can't actually do anything. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. And then I'd like to go next. You're welcome to. Ron Marcello. I live in Black Mountain four years. Um, I wish I discovered this county earlier. You guys are great. The county's great. But we do have problems like everybody else. I'm addressing the same issue. And I have a little speech, so you're going to have to listen to it, I guess. Our forefathers fought a revolutionary war to correct the injustice of being ruled and taxed by foreign power in England with no say in their or representation. Then our founders formed a great nation. Democratic notion, our leaders being selected and voted into office by the people for the people for a specific term, a designated length of time. In Black Mountain, now I'm in Black Mountain, I know there's other places that are the same, same problem. Term is four years. <clears throat> now the commissioners decided with legally to switch the elections to even number of years from odd number of years, which is all fine and dandy, except in the change hour process, our leaders decided to give themselves an extra unapproved year in office. So now we have four unelected representatives in the Black Mountain Council, two of them which were appointed, they were never elected in the first place. And they got a free year, so I, I don't get it. True patriots would have limited their terms to three years and then had an election, not take an extra year to go five years. Canceling an election undermines the basic tenet of our democratic republic to which we have all pledged our allegiance to our founding fathers who fought our revolution. This may technically have been legal, but it surely was wrong. And I petitioned the county as being the leading, the Ute County Commission, as being the leaders in the county of, of over everybody to maybe contact our legislatures and say, you know, hey, this is great, they want to change their election, and maybe they should put a little am amendment in there that said, whatever, it's called in there that says you want to change the year go one less year don't give yourself a free year i mean we it's it's wrong <laughs> thank you all right thank you very much mary standard we're continuing the theme montreat but as of 2020, four municipalities in Buncombe County have town councils that were not fully elected by their residents. The 2019 and 2021 elections in Montreat, Black Mountain, Biltmore Forest were canceled at the specific request of incumbent council members and at their own request given a fifth unelected year in office. Asheville elections were similarly canceled and council members given a fifth year in office when Asheville's mayor requested of General Assembly to change the election year cycle. In 2019, more than 75,000 Buncombe County residents, 40% of your county voters were denied access to the ballot box and denied the right to vote. The Montreat, Black Mountain, and Biltmore Forest elections were canceled only three to four weeks before the July 5th filing date. Potential candidates were already prepared to file. Such actions undermines confidence in the entire voting process. The Buncombe County Commissioners did not cause this problem, nor can you fix it. However, as the highest elected governing body in Buncombe County, you do have the political voice and are empowered to speak for Buncombe County residents. We, I, the disenfranchised, ask that the commissioners place and support a resolution or statement on the February 4th agenda that speaks for those denied the right to vote by the cancellation of municipal elections in Buncombe County 
that calls for officials to serve only the terms to which they were elected, and three, affirms that if a democratic society is to exist, the voter must have confidence in the system. This are simple, basic, and nonpartisan concepts. There are some 550 municipalities in North Carolina with the potential to change their election year cycle. Therefore, as leaders of the county and the state, we also ask that the commissioners consider advancing a proposal to state legislatures which would prevent the cancellation of municipal elections with sitting council members being given an extra year in office. But that never happens again in Buncombe County, and it should not happen in the state of North Carolina. Yesterday, each commissioner was sent working drafts and contact information. We ask for your unified support in supporting free and fair elections. Nothing, yes, nothing that you do as a commission could be more important. Thank you for your attention. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, ma'am. Marilyn Savansky, Black Mountain. Good evening. Our right to vote matters. It's very disturbing and unfair that locally elected officials and representatives in the General Assembly <coughs> stripped away our right to vote in 2019 and is established again in 2021. Losing our right to vote and to run for office even just once, matters. A significant portion of the population of Buncombe County, specifically the people of Asheville, Black Mountain, Biltmore Forest, and Montreat, have been disenfranchised. Will you turn your heads away and say nothing? Will you condone this attack on the very foundation of our form of government. <clears throat> All right. Um, who else? Yes, in the back. And then uh, Mr. Sullivan, you can get after afterwards. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Hannah Honeycutt. I live in Asheville with my family. And I'm also an employee of Buncombe County. I sent an email last week explaining some recent changes the county administration has made to our health insurance policy and explaining my concerns with those changes. I don't want to reiterate all of those concerns, but I do want to touch on an issue that my colleagues have expressed is very troublesome to them about this new policy. According to the personnel ordinance that is in place, the county commissioners must approve any change in the employee benefit structure or options. The county administration has stated that because this policy um, is voluntary, it does not affect any change on the options or structure. However, for most Buncombe County employees, those who do not make six figures, it is a change to the options and structures that are available to us, and it is not voluntary. For the past eight years that I have worked for the county, all I had to do to receive health insurance was to pay a premium with, from every paycheck. Now, in order to receive those same benefits, I have to pay my premium and either engage in one of two available options. The first option is to pay an additional $2,633 per year for the same benefit. Or, if I elect not to do that, my spouse who is not a county employee and I have to um, jump through a bunch of hoops. The first of which is we have to go see a medical professional and have an intravenous blood draw conducted where they take our blood and submit it to a laboratory for testing. This is not testing that our doctors have asked for. This is testing that the county has mandated. We have to be assigned a health risk score, and if our score is too high, according to some arbitrary standards set up either by the county or by this company they've contracted with, we have to go for additional appointments. My husband has to do this as well, and he's not even a county employee. We also have to consent to the release of our medical information to a third party company, a company that we know nothing about. This is troubling because our health information should remain protected. 
Maybe the employees who make six figures can afford to pay the $2,633 per year additional, but the employees making between forty dollars and $50,000 cannot. That includes sheriff's deputies, social workers, IT professionals, detention officers, economic services employees, and many more. That's 5.5 to 7% of their yearly salary. Perhaps it would be different if the county was offering us an incentive to engage, like in Henderson County, where their premiums are not paid for by the employee, but they're not. We are asking the board to review this decision of the county, as required by the personnel ordinance, before allowing the implementation of a plan that negatively and unfairly impacts Buncombe County employees. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, sure. Mr. Sullivan, or the other person? Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Matthew Putnam. I live in Black Mountain. I'm an attorney for, and for the past 13 years, I've represented the Buncombe County Department of Health and Human Services in all courts of this state, including the Court of Appeals and our North Carolina State Supreme Court. As my colleague, Ms. Honeycutt, points out, county administration is attempting to make major changes to employee benefits and our health benefits without any oversight from the Board of Commission. This oversight is required by the ordinance. It is my understanding that county legal has advised that the changes are so minor that they can skirt around Board of Commissioner oversight. This oversight is critical not only for the protection of the employee, but for the protection of the taxpayer. The fact that, the, that in order to get the same health insurance benefits that I've received for the past 13 years, I have to have blood drawn uh, with a needle is just one small step to show that these changes are major and should be approved and reviewed by the Board of Commissioners before taking effect. What's more disturbing than the blood draw is the fact that county legal and this current county administration is taking an approach that would even attempt to skirt past Board of Commissioner oversight. Our recent scandals have shown that transparency and oversight should be the touchstones of not only every county employee, but certainly the Board of Commissioners. So I'm asking you as the Board of Commissioners, with the citizens and the voters watching, you exercise your oversight that's required by the ordinance. Choose oversight over an obscure legal opinion. Choose responsible transparency over the convenience of a county administration seeking to make whole cloth changes. The ordinance requires it, and frankly, the citizens of Buncombe County deserve the oversight that the commission is required to do. So please, I ask you to exercise this oversight that's required by the ordinance and debate the changes that are put forth by our administration. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Putnam. Mr. Sullivan. Good evening, County Commissioners. My name is Andrew Selwyn. I live in Riceville. And I'm here this evening to speak to you about helping build tourism in Buncombe County. Uh, you may ask, hey, wait, isn't that your job on the, the TDA board? Uh, what are you coming to us for? Uh, but if you can indulge me for a moment, I want to tell you why uh, you, we as a board are having trouble doing our jobs. Without diving too much in the weeds or of nomenclature or what things are called, Buncombe County collects an occupancy tax. While we are called the Buncombe County Tourism Development Authority, most of our metrics for designating our success, including part of the bonuses given to explore Asheville personnel, are based on occupancy. Perhaps a better name for us would be the Buncombe County Occupancy Authority, or to be catchy, perhaps just Occupy Buncombe. Our focus on keeping occupancy uh, rates high precludes us from acting in a more holistic manner to address what can be done to keep tourism as part of our economy for the long term. The Occupy Buncombe Board has heard from experts at organizations like Destination Next, uh, who tell us that our support in the community is weak and that this will erode our area as a destination over time. Yet when faced with opportunities to gain more community support, we are not listening to what our community is saying. It's not that we don't have the money to put towards other uses. Explore Asheville recently switched over to a new marketing firm who told us we were oversaturating areas with advertisements and that we could save over $900,000 per year and not lose any market share. 
when your organization has too much money in your budget, overspending by almost a million dollars is a fairly easy thing to do, present company excluded. If Occupy Buncom isn't able to look at our long-term needs, it's really up to the commission to be the voice of reason to help our community grow smarter. I've admired some of the action this commission has taken under the direction of Chairman Newman to focus on solar energy, both for the health of our planet as well as the benefit of our pocketbooks. We need that same focus directed towards tourism in our area. At the moment, there are many who don't feel that we are getting anything back from the tourists who come here. That tourists spending their money at local businesses just isn't enough. Let's prove them wrong. Let's take some of the occupancy tax dollars and spend them on affordable housing and transportation. Things that would help those in our community who are most left behind in our current economy. As a small business owner, I depend on tourists as an important component of my retail business. Please help keep this portion of the economy sustainable by putting more occupancy tax dollars into things that matter most to our community. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Yes, Ben. My name is Sheridan Hill. I've lived in Black Mountain since 2003, and thank you for this time for public comment. I'm just echoing uh, the sentiments of my um, fellow residents of Black Mountain that our right to vote for representation uh, in form of the Board of Aldermen was taken away, and that just is not right. Um, um, we're all tax-paying citizens of the county. I pay more than $2,500 a year in city-county taxes to live in, in Black Mountain, and we really, really would appreciate you taking a moment to look at this right that was taken away from us. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rice. I'm getting old. <laughs> we just had the park and recreation interview, recreation and all that, and I'm disturbed about it because of what potential that it's fixing to do to us. The, if you have been on this board or know of it, the Cultural Recreation Authority was done away with, but at the time that the legislators passed House Bill 418 in 2013 to create a advisory board and to create a tax too, because the county come out with this uh, 3.5 cent ad valorem tax in 2014. My, my point is getting very good here, and that's the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. The taxpayers should not be burdened with this money of what you're fixing to do with this advisory board and all these politicians that's going to be sitting on it. When I say politicians, I'm talking about people that have big investments in the community. They're, they're real estate people, they're business people, and there are other kinds of people on there that is going to be profiting, and that's exactly what it's going to be. It's going to be a profiting community of people from this. Not to mention that the thing that I want to present to you is the room tax. I want to present a solution. We need to get the room tax money that the tourism development is uh, throwing out all these millions of dollars because who is going to pay for this? It's going to be the taxpayers, the property taxpayers of this county that can't afford to do that. These people are coming in here from Delaware, New Jersey, New York, and all these other big states, and they're running from property taxes at the rate of eight thousand and some dollars a year, and that's the, that is on the low end. That's the average of some of these people are paying these kind of taxes, and they're coming here and raping our community and leaving us taxpayers that can't afford it with the bill. So we need to start thinking out of the box. This recreation authority advisory, all this uh, stuff that you're talking about, who is benefiting from it? It is certainly not us as citizens of Buncombe County. The people that you're appointing is people from other states that come in here to make the way just like they come from, and they don't realize they're doing it at to our community. You need to wake up and think about it. I'm tired of paying high taxes, and you commissioners can do something about it. We do not need to pay taxes for this recreation stuff. 
we need to have the recreation authority over there with the sales tax, not sales tax, but the room tax, where these tourism people are coming in here. Thank you. All right, thank you. Ms. Riel. I just thought I had problems. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to tell the folks at Black Mountain and Montreal how to solve their problem. You don't do a TV show for 10 to 12 years and tell the county commissioners and the politicians in Buffalo County that Wanda Green was crooked. Yeah, I did. All those 10, 15 years. And guess who turned out being right? I don't know a lot. I'm just simple and I ask simple questions. The way we got the vote on zoning in Buncombe County is because of your legislatures. If the county commissioners all agree, that's every one of them, all political parties agree, and go as a unit to the legislative boys and girls and say, we want this, there's an unwritten law in Raleigh that the folks will go along with it because they in their county may want something done special. Do you get what I'm saying? So you're right. First step, get all the county commissioners to write a letter to all your local delegations. But then you're going to have to call your local delegations, every one of you, if you're really ticked off about it. And you will get it changed. That's how we got the vote on zoning because I made the call and told somebody on the other side of the political spectrum what was fixing to happen. And the next morning, Bill Stanley announced we'd have a vote on zoning. But he didn't make it binding, okay? So that'll solve your problem right there, folks. Now, on this transportation study, you don't do a TV show like I did all those years without you don't look at transportation. Folks, New York can't pay for their transportation program with fares. We don't have a dense enough population in America to have mass transit. We don't have it. We sure don't have it in Buncombe County. So that's why I asked my question a long time ago. How many is riding each route? What does it cost for each person? What's it going to cost to expand the route? Simple questions, folks not complicated and when you hear the word up here well i can't exactly get all that out you all should be saying okay do it that's what your pre-meetings are for spend the time in there getting the real details don't make it a dog and pony show because this is election year and i can tell you right now the people i can see it right now in black mountain and Montreal, ain't going to be a fruit basket turnover up there the next election i've got a sneaky feeling is that going to happen or not, folks? It's up to you. It is up to you. Get it back. I told you how to get it. Thank you very much. So let's keep the paper and the TV will pick up on that. Thanks. Um, anything else? All right. A couple of announcements. On Tuesday, January 28th at 1 p.m., the County Commission will hold a special meeting to conduct interviews for boards and commissions. That will be... Um, on the at 200 College Street on the third floor, um, we'll convene the meeting in open session here. We will actually hold the interviews in the conference room, which is immediately behind the commission chambers. But it will be an open meeting, so the public is invited to attend if you're interested in that. On February 4th at 3 p.m., the county commissioners will have their next pre meeting at 200 College Street, room 326. And then that same day at 5 p.m., the county commissioners we will hold their next regular meeting at 5 p.m. There's... Yes, thank you. The personnel closed session to uh, conduct reviews of two county commission employees will be at 4 p.m. on February 4th. So we need to keep the free meeting uh, such that it concludes by 4 o'clock. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, is there a need for a closed session? All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? All in favor, please say aye. 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 aye.